Hi there. Thank you for joining me today again in our study in the book of Acts. Today we are in chapter 6 and we're going to start at verse 1. And we're going to do the whole chapter today, but there is only 15 verses in it. So we're going to go down to the end of 15, verse 15. Here we're going to see how the first deacons were appointed and why. And then we are going to see how Stephen uh, was so powerful that when they tried to argue with him, they couldn't overcome. So they had to use false witnesses to try to bring a conviction through Stephen. So this is going to be an exciting time today. I'm looking forward to sharing this with you. Once again, thank you for joining me on our study in the book of Acts. Today we are in chapter 6, verse 1. So let's just jump right in here. In those days when the number of the disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebronic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So we have two different types of Jews here is talking about. It's talking about Grecian Jews and Hebronic Jews. And the only difference between the two is that the Grecian Jews spoke Greek and the Hebronic Jews spoke uh, Hebrew. So they're basically all Jews. They just spoke a different language. It continues on in verse 2, it says, So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. So the disciples got everybody together and they say, Look, if there's a problem here with the situation where we're distributing food and whatnot, this, is, this isn't something that we need to get involved in because it's our job to, to study the Word of God and, and to, to do the ministry of the Word, not to worry about waiting on tables. So their suggestion in verse 3 says, Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Came up with a very good solution here. They said, let's choose some men who are able to look after this service, to look after the distribution of food and whatnot, so that we can put our focus on, on the ministry of prayer and of, of teaching the word. So this is what is known as the deacons, that the start of the deacons. So the, the job of the deacon, according to how it was set up in the book of Acts, is to do the physical things that needs to be done in, the, in whatever ministry you're in. So if you're in a church and there's a feeding program or there's you know, things that need to be done, this is what the deacons would do in order to allow the, in this case, the apostles to study the word and to spend their time in prayer. And we can take that over into today that the, the pastors, um, and the teachers, they could, they could have that time to study the Word and to spend in prayer and ministering to the congregation and not have to worry about the other things that the deacons can look after, the ushering, the feeding programs, what a child's ministry, whatever it is. So oftentimes we see in the church set up like that, that this is what the deacons do. Now, there are times when there's a deacon board that runs the church, and I'm not sure where that comes from because it's really not supported here because it was the apostles that did. And uh, so I think if we look in further in the Bible, it's more like uh, something that the elders should be doing and that the elders and the deacons should be different. Amen, but that's just my opinion. In verse five, it continues on and says, this proposal, pleased the whole group, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Procreus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They chose these seven guys to uh, look after the situ these situations and these problems that were arising uh, that some of the widows weren't getting fed and the food distribution wasn't fair or whatever. So these men were given the, uh, the job 
and the opportunity to minister uh, through, through this means. And uh, we know that these were not just ordinary men, but that they were very faithful, and especially Stephen, who we know becomes uh, the first Christian martyr. So they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. So it seems like the congregation, the, the people are the ones that chose these seven, and then they brought them to the apostles who agreed with them and then prayed for them and laid hands on them. So the word of God spread, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So this is an interesting verse here because it's saying that the, the word of God is spread, and there's many disciples coming to the Lord in Jerusalem, and it says a large number of the priests became obedient to the faith. The priests were the ones who, who originally um, put Jesus to death on the cross. They were the ones who, who fought against Jesus and, and were opposing him and didn't, didn't want to have anything to do with him. And now because they're seeing the power of this word, they're seeing the power of this name, many of them uh, turned and came, came to the Lord. I'm sure it, start, it started uh, a great stir in the, in the high priests and the, and the other priests that were, were doing the service that they thought for the Lord. In verse 8, it goes on, it says, Now Stephen, a man of full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs amongst the people. So this Stephen, who was chosen as one of the deacons, he, he was no small person in the kingdom of God. Like, he was, he was a mighty person, right? He, he had a real anointing on him, and uh, he did a lot of miraculous signs amongst the people. People were being healed, and, and they could see God's grace and power in his life. Verse 9, it says, Opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexander, as well as the province of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by which he spoke. If we look at this, it says the synagogue of freedmen, and, and I did some research on this, and the best I can tell is that these were uh, Africans that were in Jerusalem. Um, it doesn't really matter. They called them freedmen. Uh, anyways, they rose up against what Stephen was doing and these other people as well. They began to speak with Stephen and argue with him. But the amazing thing is that they, they could not overcome the wisdom or the spirit by which he spoke. And this is a great encouragement to us because oftentimes we feel that we are not adequate to speak for God or that we feel that we're not adequate to do the things of God, that we, we're, we're not great in speech or we don't have the wisdom that it takes to speak to somebody. I think what we can understand here is that when we devote ourselves to God, God gives us the strength and he gives us the wisdom. And that's what happened with Stephen here. They could not withstand him because of the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. So that spirit by which Stephen spoke from, the spirit that was in him, is the same spirit that is in us. And if we can come to a point where we depend on that spirit that's in us, then we too can be like Stephen. Because as we're going to see in uh, the next little while here, as we go through uh, what happened with Stephen, we are going to see that he was a faithful man and that he didn't quaver back at all from what he believed, even though he knew he was in a perilous situation where he was eventually going to be uh, martyred as a first Christian martyr, where he's going to be stoned to death. But he spoke up with wisdom and by, by the Spirit, and they couldn't, they couldn't argue with him because his, his arguments made sense. And there was the word of God was with him. And remember, it said in verse 8 that he was full of grace and power and that he did uh, great wonders and miraculous signs amongst the people. It's pretty hard to argue when people are doing miraculous signs. Now, it doesn't tell us exactly what he was doing, but I'm sure the lame were walking, the blind were seeing, the deaf were hearing, and different things like this was happening. So how do you argue against that when you're trying to argue against somebody? And it says here that, that they just could not stand up with the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke to them. 
Verse 11, it continues, it says, They secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. If they couldn't argue with Stephen and persuade him that what he was doing was wrong, if they were being uh, bested by the arguments that Stephen was bringing forth and they were not able to stand because of the wisdom and the spirit of God in him, they thought, okay, we will we will do this in a different way. And so what they did is they, they engaged some men to lie against what Stephen had said and to bring false witness to what Stephen had said. And so they persuaded some men to say that they heard Stephen speak of these blasphemy words against Moses and against God. Of course, we know it's not true because uh, he loved Moses. He loved God, right? He was a man after God's heart. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. Because of their opposition to Stephen and because they couldn't get Stephen to switch his, his understanding, they brought these false witnesses and they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers and they seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. Now, for those of you who don't know what the Sanhedrin is, the Sanhedrin is just a court. Um, that's the court of the law at that time. If you had a charge against somebody, you would bring them to the Sanhedrin. They would have uh, hold a court session. In verse 13, it says, They produced false witnesses to testify. This fellow never stopped speaking against the holy place and against the law. So they brought in a bunch of liars. They brought in a bunch of false witnesses. And these false witnesses spoke against Stephen, saying that he never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law which of course we know isn't true, right? Verse 14, For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the custom Moses has handed down to us. Now, I don't think that he probably said that Jesus would destroy this place. This goes back to where Jesus says to his disciples, destroy this place and in three days I will rebuild it again. Of course, Jesus was talking about his body and they thought he was talking about the temple. It's true that the customs of Moses are being changed in some, some aspects because we remember we're under a new covenant now. We're not under that old covenant. There is a change in the covenant. There's a change with way which we relate to God and how we, we walk with him. And of course, they were opposing that. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So here all these charges are being brought against Stephen. And, and what is Stephen? Stephen's just sitting there in the glory of God. He's just sitting there knowing that, that he is with God. And so they, they are just being befuddled here because here they're looking over and here, here he looks like an angel sitting there, like so, so amazing, right? And so there's a lot of frustration there for them. Now, I think for us today, this is a great encouragement to see the fortitude that, that Stephen had, to see that he stood up and like he was in a place in his relationship with God that in the midst of this trial, in the midst of all these false witnesses coming against him, what, what was Stephen doing? Was he biting his nails? Was he shaking? Was he worried? No, he was radiating the glory of God. They looked over him and thought they were looking at an angel. So this is a great encouragement for us that when, when we do what God is calling us to do, when we are obedient to what he is asking us to do, he is with us and he will, he will be with us and he will walk with us. He'll give us the strength and he'll give us the words that we need in order to fulfill the things that he wants to do. God has a plan and a purpose for each one of us. Stephen, he had a plan for Stephen. It wasn't that Stephen was going to be on this earth for a long time, but he had a plan and a purpose for him. And Stephen really fulfilled something. Even though he died early, he, he became a symbol for all of the Christians on how we can stand and just lean on the Lord and just whatever happens to us, it happens. And as we go through this, we're going to see how powerful Stephen was through all of that. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness and your love. We thank you that you are with us. We thank you for men like Stephen, Lord, who are an example for all of us, Lord. Men like Stephen who, who 
who stood up for righteousness, who stood up for what you are all about, and men who put their life on the line without fear. And we just thank you for that. We thank you for the uh, witness he is and the example he is for each and every one of us. Father, I just pray that you would give us all strength in the midst of persecution, in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of wanting to testify about you. Give us the strength that we might speak the words that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, thank you again for joining me. I hope that you will be with us on our next session as we go through and see what happens in this trial with Stephen. It's amazing what he does. Remember, God loves you, and so do I. Take us home, girls.